the conversation where Steve pointed out that Jeff Clark would be left leading a graveyard. And that that comment clearly had an impact on the president. The leadership will be gone. Jeff Clark will be left leading a graveyard. Again, the premise that Mr. Donahue has said, but that Mr. Clark could come in and take over the Department of Justice and do something different was just an absurd premise. And all he was doing, Mr. Clark, by putting himself forward was blowing himself up. And, you know, if the president were to have gone that course, you know, it would have been a grievous error for the president as well. Was Cipollone, the White House counsel, told the committee that Mr. Engel's response had a noticeable impact on the president, that this was a turning point in the conversation? Mr. Donahue, towards the end of this meeting, did the president ask you what was going to happen to Mr. Clark? He did. When we finally got to the, I would say the last 15 minutes of the meeting, the president's decision was apparent. He announced it. Jeff Clark tried to scrape his way back and ask the president to reconsider. The president doubled down and said, no, I've made my decision. That's it. We're not going to do it. And then he turned to me and said, so what happens to him now? I'm meeting Mr. Clark. And he understood that Mr. Clark reported to me. And I didn't initially understand the question. I said, Mr. President, and he said, are you going to fire him? And I said, I don't have the authority to fire him. He's a Senate confirmed assistant attorney general. And he said, well, who has the authority to fire him? And I said, only you do, sir. And he said, well, I'm not going to fire him. I said, all right, well, then we should all go back to work. Today's date, June 23rd, 2022. Something like that. What was that about? The president, at this point, we left the White House, reconvened at the department. I left the department. I was back at my apartment. My cell phone rang. It was the president. And he had information about a truck supposedly full of shredded ballots in Georgia that was in the custody of an ICE agent whose name he had. I told him that ICE was part of Department of Homeland Security. I had heard about this. The Department of Homeland Security needed our assistance. We, of course, would provide it. But it was really up to DHS to make a call if their agent was involved. And he said, fine, I understand. Can you just make sure that Ken, being Ken Cuccinelli, knows about this? I said, fine, I would pass that along to him. I eventually contacted Ken Cuccinelli later that evening, and I said, this is what the president told me. If you guys have anything you think should be brought to our attention, let me know. And he said, thank you, and that was it. Mr. Cipollone left the meeting convinced the president would not appoint Mr. Clark, but he didn't think the president had actually accepted the truth about the election. Sure enough, all the same debunked theories appeared in his speech at the Ellipse three days later. In the state of Arizona, over 36,000 ballots were illegally cast by non-citizens. 11,600 more ballots and votes were counted, more than there were actual voters. You see that? In Wisconsin, corrupt Democrat-run cities deployed more than 500 illegal, unmanned, unsecured drop boxes, which collected a minimum of 91,000 unlawful votes. Mr. Donahue, Mr. Rosen, Mr. Engel, and others stopped President Trump's efforts, at least temporarily. Yet the message President Trump and his Republican allies pushed throughout December made its way to his supporters anyway, and they kept up the pressure campaign on the way to storming the Capitol on January 6th. Mr. Rosen, were you at the Department of Justice on January 6th? Yes, I was there all day. Once the Capitol was under attack, I understand that you communicated with fellow cabinet members and Capitol Hill leadership. Can you tell us who you spoke to? Yeah, I was basically on the phone virtually nonstop all day. Some calls with our own DOJ folks, some with cabinet counterparts at DHS and Defense and the Interior, some with senior White House officials, and with a number of congressional leaders. I received calls from Speaker Pelosi, from Leader McCarthy, from Leader Schumer. I believe Leader McConnell's chief of staff called a number of other members of Congress as well. And the basic thrust of the calls with the members of Congress was 
there's a you know, dire situation here and, and can you help? And I reported to them that we were on a very urgent basis sending help from the department. Uh, we, we wound up sending over 500 agents and officers from FBI, ATF, and the U.S. Marshals to assist with restoring order at the Capitol. So I had a number of calls. As I say, it was more or less nonstop all afternoon. Did you speak to the vice president that day? Yes, twice. No, please go ahead. Well, I was going to say the first call was a one-on-one discussion, somewhat akin to the congressional leadership calls, updating him on what we were doing to assist. And the second call was a conference call around 7 o'clock with the vice president, congressional leaders, senior White House staff, some other cabinet officials to address that order appeared to be close to being restored, or restored but security still being determined, and the question being what time could the Congress reassemble. And the answer was 8 o'clock, and thankfully Congress did reassemble and complete its constitutional duty. There was one highlight of that second call with the vice president, which is Mr. Donohue had gone to the rotunda of the Capitol to be able to give firsthand account and was able to tell the folks on the call, including the vice president, that we thought 8 o'clock would work. Did you speak to the president on January 6th? No. I spoke to a number of senior White House officials, but not the president. Mr. Donohue, on January 6th, we know from Mr. Rosen that you helped in the effort to reconvene the joint session. The joint session, is that correct? Yes, sir. We see here in a video that we're going to play now you arriving with your security detail to help secure the Capitol. Mr. Donohue, 30 minutes after you arrived at the Capitol, did you lead a briefing for the vice president? I'm not sure exactly what the time frame was, but I did participate in the call and participate in briefing the vice president as well as the congressional leadership that night. And where did you conduct that call at? I was in an office. I'm not entirely sure where it was. My detail found it because the acoustics in the rotunda were such that it wasn't really conductive to having a call, so they found an office. We went to that office, and I believe I participated in two phone calls, one at 1800 and one at 1900 that night from that office. What time did you actually end up leaving the Capitol? I waited until the Senate was back in session, which I believe they were gaveled in a few minutes after 8 p.m. And once they were back in session and we were confident that the entire facility was secured and cleared, that there were no individuals hiding in closets or under desks, that there were no IEDs or other suspicious devices left behind, I left minutes later. I was probably gone by 830. And Mr. Donohue, did you ever hear from President Trump that day? No. Like the AAG, the acting AG, I spoke to Pat Cipollone and Mark Meadows and the vice president and the congressional leadership, but I never spoke to the president that day. So in today's hearing, you've showcased the efforts of the Americans before us to stand up for democracy. Mr. Rosen, Mr. Donohue stayed steadfastly committed to the oath they take as officials in the Department of Justice. On January 6th itself, they assisted during the attack while our commander-in-chief stayed silent. Their bravery is a high moment in the sordid story of what led to January 6th. My colleagues and I up here also take an oath. Some of them failed to uphold theirs and instead chose to spread the big lie. Days after the tragic events of January 6th, some of these same Republican members requested pardons in the waning days of the Trump administration. Five days after the attack on the Capitol, Representative Mo Brooks sent the email on the screen now. As you see, he emailed the White House, quote, pursuant to a request from Matt Gaetz, requesting a pardon for Representative Gaetz himself and unnamed others. Witnesses told the select committee that the president considered offering pardons to a wide range of individuals connected to the president. Let's listen to some of that testimony. As was Representative Gaetz requesting a pardon? I believe so. 
the, the general tone was we may get prosecuted because we were defensive of you know, the president's positions on these things. The pardon that he was discussing, requesting, was as broad as you could describe from the beginning of memories, from the beginning of time up until today, for any and all things. He mentioned Nixon, and I said Nixon's pardon was never nearly that broad. And are you aware of any members of Congress in pardons? I guess Mr. Gates and Mr. Brooks, I know, have both advocated for there be a blanket pardon for members involved in that meeting, and a handful of other members that weren't at the December 21st meeting um, as the preemptive pardons. Uh, Mr. Gates is personally pushing for a pardon, and he's doing so since early December. I'm not sure why. Uh, Mr. Gates had reached out to me to ask if he could have a meeting with Mr. Meadows about receiving a presidential pardon. Did they all have that view? Not all of them, but several of them did. So who do you think do Mr. Gates and Mr. Brooks? Um, Mr. Fakes did. Mr. Jordan talked about congressional pardons, but he never asked me for one. It was more for an update on whether the White House is going to pardon members of Congress. Mr. Gomer asked for one as well. And Mr. Perry asked for a pardon too. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. Did you spell out your acronym correctly? Yes, you did. Did uh, Mark Jolene contact you? No, she didn't contact me about it. I heard that she had asked White House Counsel Office for a pardon from Mr. Philbin, but I didn't frequently communicate with Ms. Green. Are you aware of any conversations or communications regarding the possibility of giving Congressman Matt Gates a pardon? Um, I know he had asked for it, but I don't know if he ever received one or what happened with it. How do you know that Congressman Gates asked for a pardon? He told me. Uh, tell us about that. He told me to ask Meadows for a pardon. Were you involved in or did you witness any conversations about the possibility of a blanket pardon for everyone involved in January 6th? Uh, I have heard that mentioned, yeah. Do you know whether the president had any conversations about potentially pardoning a, uh, family members? Um, I know he had hinted at a blanket pardon for the January 6th thing for anybody, um, but I think he had for all the staff and everyone involved, not with January 6th, but just before he left office, I know he had talked about that. The only reason I know to ask for a pardon is because you think you've committed a crime. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. 